Um, hello, everyone. Eid Mubarak for those who uh, celebrate. Uh, my name is Aysam Abdelrasul Bubakar in uh, Assistant Editor of Middle East Critique. Um, thank you also for being here today. So um, just a quick few words about this course, if this is the first time you join, and sorry if you hear this mantra again, but it's just important to do this intro and ground ourselves in why are we doing this course as a journal, given the events happening in Palestine. So as a journal, we decided to launch this open pedagogical initiative called the Ramadan course on Palestine and imperialism. And just for some grounding, it has been six months since the beginning of the genocide of the Palestinian people in Gaza. And there are a number of reasons why we offer this free open course. First, the course has been put together and launched in support of the people of Palestine and their call for a global wave of action during the month of Ramadan and after, where people from all walks of life dedicate their time and abilities to end the genocide happening in Gaza. So as academics, scholars, and activists, we decided that our abilities could be put at the service of this global wave of action by organizing an educational platform that is accessible to the general public, even more so in light of the silencing and censoring of numerous academics within public and private ins educational institutions, both in the global north and south, that have been trying to speak logically on these issues. Second, the course doesn't simply focus on Palestine, but it purposely aims to connect the Palestinian question with the question of imperialism. There have been numerous teach-ins being organized and educational initiatives being pursued in the face of the genocide. And there are thousands of books being written and have been written on Palestine. Yet while they all provide useful insights on Palestinian society, most of them tend to dilute and water down the role that the US-led imperialism has played and continues to play in the region. And how this is tied to the question of national liberation in Palestine. The course is also meant to ground us in a broader understanding of the political thought in the region and the geopolitical changes the region has witnessed. In other words, in order to understand US-led imperialism, we also un must understand its functions and its functionaries in the region. In doing so, we invited scholars from various fields to explain the enduring relevance and intellectual necessity of picking up the philosophical tradition anchored in historical materialism to revisit the unprecedented events that we are witnessing today. In doing so, we will be touching on various topics. As I will share with you, the next coming sessions will address various topics related to Palestine. I'm going to share with you in the chat. With me today is Matteo, Louis, and Bikram. So if you um, have been to previous sessions, you probably know uh, Dr. Matteo, Dr. Matteo Kapas is the editor of this journal, Middle East Critique Journal, and he's a Mary Curie Global Fellow working across Catoscari University of Venice, Italy, and Columbia University in the city of New York. So uh, please, Matteo, the floor is yours to introduce uh, our uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Esam. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, for repeating some informations that probably some of you have heard so many times, but, you know, there are always new attendance and, and it's important for us to make sure that everybody knows why we're uh, we launched this activity and why we think it's important in this historical moment an historical moment that you know makes us also witness unprecedented events like the one that we're living since yesterday evening at least for us in the in our time zone for the first time in uh in 75 years uh israel has found itself under a massive uh, retro retaliatory uh, military attack directly being launched from the territory of the Islamic Republic of Iran. An attack that was launched in response, as we know, to a number of military operations that Israel uh, perpetrated over Iranian sovereignty and individuals, but most importantly, the one related to the attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus on April 1st, this past April, that resulted in the killing of 16 people. Now, we know that the US, the UK, and France, uh, some of the major uh, imperialist powers, uh, Western imperialist powers, uh, obstructed immediately the United Nations Security Council in condemning the Israeli attack. Yet the same Western powers rushed to describe the Iranian actions as senseless and depraved attacks on an ally of the enlightened West. I have to mention this because the events we're living today are of, a such, of, a mag of a such a magnitude that we can hardly be passive observer to the mounting drums of war that are coming in the region. 
And uh, we launched this activity not just to analyze, uh, you know, extemporarily in the present, to have an analysis, so-called presentist analysis that focuses on the now without understanding how we reach this moment. And on the contrary, we emphasize the question of method, the question of historical materialism as a way to understand how we, under how we reach this point. And on the basis of this today, if yesterday we had uh, two very young scholars, uh, Samar Al Saleh and Patrick Higgins, soon we're going to upload the, the session we had yesterday. Young scholars who are trying to understand, who are trying to make sense, and are explaining to us beautifully the importance of the Palestinian uh, the, of the Palestinian Revolution back since the 19th century. Today, I have the pleasure to have two friends intellectuals, you know, collective intellectual and comrades with me, Bikram Gill and Louis Alday. Uh, I think I'm going to start with Bikram, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Aspect at Virginia Tech in the US. Bikram's work has appeared in a range of academic journals, including politics, globalization, environmental planning, uh, some of which we're going to sh be sharing today. Uh, if they are in paywall, we're going to do our best to share them with uh, with you, but uh, otherwise feel free also to contact directly the author, Bikram. And Bikram also has a book forthcoming, which I really recommend for those who want to understand the, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the mechanics of capitalism uh, beyond Palestine, but also in relation to the political ecology. His book is coming, it's forthcoming with Manchester University Press titled The Political Ecology of Colonial Capitalism. The session today is about Palestine, Syria, and the question of anti-imperialism. Bikram, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Matteo. And thank you, Assam. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this um, a uh, very kind of uh, important and generative lecture series that Middle East Critique has been hosting. Um, I have uh, definitely learned from many of the earlier sessions. <laughs> I think what, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to uh, offer more of a kind of a general structural analysis of the uh, imperialist system, um, uh, particularly as it relates to um, the region and the, the place that Palestine holds uh, in, in in imperialism. So both how how imperialism is a significant question to understand the subjugation of Palestine and how Palestinian liberation is necessarily central to the broader anti-imperialist uh, struggle. Uh, so those are those are some things I'm going to try to do. So think about it structurally. What is the imperialist uh, system and what is anti-imperialism? Um, and then I think. In so doing, it can. I'm hoping maybe in the Q and A and elsewhere, we can get to some questions about how this can help us think through uh, Palestine, Palestinian liberation is simultaneously a national question, but it's integrated into a broader regional question, and it's an international question, right? And I think uh, with what happened yesterday with the Iranian strikes, I think it's important for us to clarify the difference uh, between imperialism and um, uh, actions by other states. That are taken in response to imperialism, right? So yesterday was not uh, an, an action of inter-imperialism. It was something very different. Uh, uh, so we want to distinguish between imperialism and anti-imperialism versus those who try to use an inter-imperialist framework. Uh, okay, so I'm going to begin then, just uh, before getting to the question of Palestine and anti-imperialism, just maybe for the people listening, uh, just to clarify what I understand imperialism to be, how what I understand this system to consist of. And I think it's important to be precise, so it may be helpful to begin by distinguishing imperialism, the relation of imperialism from colonialism. Uh, now, these two terms are often used interchangeably, and they, they are indeed similar, the relation of colonialism and imperialism, they, they are similar, they're quite close to one another, in that both are premised in the first and last instance on a denial of sovereignty to those peoples who are subjugated under these relations, whether they're colonialism uh, or, or imperialism. Now, both, both colonialism and imperialism involve the use of the usurpation of sovereignty to reorient um, subjugated peoples, their lands, their labors, towards servicing the interests of the usurping entity. That's, I think, a, a very general way that both colonialism and imperialism work together. Now, how would you distinguish between the two? I think the way I understand it, colonialism and this may not be uh, agreed upon definition, but this works for me, 
uh, I, I, I understand colonialism more in thinking about a one-to-one -one relationship between colonizer to colonize. So you have colony, you have colonizer and colonize. So you might have the British Raj and the Indian colony. That's a relationship of colonialism. There's direct territorial control. Um, whereas imperialism operates more on a systemic scale, on a world systemic scale or a regional scale uh, beyond a one-to-one -one relationship. It need not involve direct ter territorial control. It can be maintained indirectly through relations of dependency. But uh, so uh, just to think about that, um, you can have an imperium, you can have peripheries and you can have a core in the imperium uh, that is maintained through a very, very variegated set of relations. Okay, so there's an uh, important way to distinguish between the two. And why this matters is you can have decolonization without anti-imperialism. You can have a reclamation of formal territorial sovereignty without actually uh, the achievement of real substantive sovereignty because a broader imperialist system continues to exist that continues to constrain the substantive sovereignty of those who are subjugated uh, in the peripheries. Now, this distinction will make more sense if we specify the specific form of imperialism we are speaking about. So we are speaking about uh, in our context, of course, the imperialism that has existed and emerged and produced and reproduced within a capitalist world system. Okay, so that's, I think, a very important uh, point to emphasize. And this will, again, help us understand this distinction between imperialism and colonialism. So what do I mean by uh, the capitalist uh, world system? So by capitalism, of course, we mean a system uh, centered upon a capital labor relationship, right? centered upon a dispossessed laboring class, and one in which the means of production are privately owned by a profit-seeking capitalist class in which both capitalists and workers are made market dependent, right? Now this market dependent capital labor contradiction generates, uh, like, I, like I just mentioned, it generates severe contradictions. Uh, and now capital labor is not the only relation in the system that generates contradictions. Inter-firm, inter-capitalist state competition also generates uh, contradictions that make it increasingly difficult as these contradictions intensify to stabilize the conditions for profit and accumulation in core capitalist regions, right? So, you know, the uh, I, I won't I won't go into this in detail. We can in the Q and A if people have questions about this. But I would I'll reference people to a recent book by uh, Utsan Prabhatpatnayak that really gets into to detail how capitalism cannot actually work as a closed loop system. Uh, on its own, right? Uh, to stabilize that capital labor contradiction, to stabilize the contradictions that arise from inter-firm competition like overaccumulation, um, the crisis of profitability, to stabilize this necessitates the construction of a zone, right? What well, we can say a zone outside of the core. And this, this is what emerges through uh, imperialist relations, right? The, the need to access uh, surplus value from a zone of the world system uh, from which the reproduction of labor, the reproduction of territory can be discarded. So you can have an absolute appropriation of value without needing to reproduce uh, the labor and the lands generating that value. Um, and those in those territories have no political claim making capacity. So there is a necessity for imperialism under capitalism, but now, Imperialism under, in order to secure a form of surplus value transfer that can stabilize the contradictions of those core capitalist relations I just discussed. Now, under, under capitalism though, imperialism takes a slightly different form. Okay, so in, in maybe pre-capitalist empires, or when we think about this, uh, we can think about imperialism as being defined as a usurpation or denial of sovereignty over those who are subjugated vis-a-vis -vis maybe direct sovereign power over territory, over land, um, uh, et cetera, right? Under capitalism, imperialism is defined at its primary level by who holds sovereign power over the flow of economic capital across space. So who holds sovereign power over capital as it goes into and out of space? The aim here is not sovereignty over territory, as I just said, resources. It's not even ownership over commodities, ultimately, right? It is sovereign power over the flow of capital into and out of the territory. So you may not even own the oil. You may not even own the uranium that is going into and out of the territory, but you control the flow. Now that, then I'll, I will clarify what that means. But um, it is this 
control over the flow of capital that allows for surplus value appropriation. And it is what allows for the setting of prices. Okay, so how are prices set? How is uneven trade established? How is unequal exchange established? Um, so these are established by maintaining, again, sovereign power over the flow of capital into and out of a territory. And this enables the subjugated territory, the territory that's subjugated by capitalist imperialism, then it reorients that territory to service the developmental needs of the core, to stabilize its contradictions. And then in the periphery, it'll lead to underdevelopment and de-development, uh, et cetera. Now, just one qualifier at this moment, this is not applicable to trade in general. Trade does not equal imperialism, right? Like the export of capital in and of itself does not equal uh, imperialism. It's, a, it's very specific to this sovereign power question over how the sovereign power over the flow of capital introduces relations of dependency, which imposes conditions of price setting of uneven trade and unequal exchange and so forth. Now, it's important then to think about, okay, if this is what imperialism is under capitalism, how are such relations established? How are relations of imperialism under capitalism established? Just one second. Now here, as I often do, I turn. I I, I think it's uh, really important to turn to the work of Samir Amin. And I would say, in general, um, an essay I'm going to be drawing on today is an essay titled "U.S. Imperialism on the Middle East." I'm not sure if Matteo and Assam can drop that in the chat. It's a, a really excellent piece. I think you can just find it by a quick Google search. I know I've shared it uh, earlier, but for Amin, uh, these relations are established. Imperialism under capitalism, they're established. He says through the two legs, right? That imperialism walks on two legs, an economic leg and a military leg. Now, in my view, it's the military leg that is first uh, very essential and predominant in establishing these relationships. And this is through the application of what Frantz Fanon calls a greater force, a greater violence. Okay, so as capitalist powers experience these contradictions or <laughs> as the capitalist system is in motion, um, the, the, the necessity to use military force to establish sovereign power over the flow of capital into and out of a territory, this imperative intensifies. I think a very good example of understanding this may be the case par excellence, historically, is the opium wars in the 19th century. right? So in the, with the opium wars, you see the use of gunboat diplomacy in the manner in which European powers led by Brit the British, British imperialists uh, uh, apply greater force upon China, and by doing so, they are able then to force China into a series of treaties. Now, this is important, right? Because this is actually similar to what's happening in Palestine today. There's a relations of force that underpin a peace treaty that is raised. And what is the outcome of the Opium War treaties, the, the post-Opium War treaties, is that they are of the sort that they grant to the British imperialists and Western imperialists more general sovereign power over the flow of capital into and out of the territory. So you see the way the British seize control of Hong Kong through the Opium Wars. And this is what then allows them to set tariffs, to set the prices um, on the goods going into and out of China. And what do we have then here? We have a rapid transformation of a situation where before the British are running large deficits in their trade relations with China. And then after the Opium Wars, now they're running large surpluses out of their trade with China, right? So we can see the way in which force enables now British imperialism to establish sovereign power over the flow of capital into and out of China. Um, so this, uh, and I think that's a really good example because you have, um, again, like a, a, in that scenario, a rapid transformation of a deficit to a surplus, which then generates the condition to strengthen the second leg of imperialism, the economic leg, which allows in this context and more generally British imperialism and then more generally imperialism to establish the monopoly control over capital, both the flow over capital, but the capital that is generated, the surplus that is generated from these processes end up um, being concentrated in the core regions, which then enables a shoring up of that first leg. Because now, even if a subjugated territory is able to militarily defeat the imperial power. The imperial power then can mobilize that second economic leg because it now holds a monopoly over capital. It can mobilize that to say, as Fanon says, 
if you want your independence taken and starved. It can impose a capital strike because all the capital has ended up in the core. Um, so this is, I think, those are the major features of um, imperialism. And I think so, I just would like folks to hold on to that because these economic and military legs of imperialism, I think are very much in crisis today and are being challenged. So then to think about anti-imperialism, uh, and Amin is very clear on this, if imperialism walks on two legs, anti-imperialism also must walk on two legs. It must walk on the military leg and the economic leg. Okay, so this is very um, different than decolonization in many ways. And I think this is an important point to emphasize, especially to understand Palestine today, um, is because the... Uh, <laughs> nice, so I saw the emojis of the two legs there. Um, the um, uh, uh, the So decolonization in the 20th century was about the formal territorial, the reclamation of territorial sovereignty, right? And we know there's been a lot of reflections from um, uh, post-colonial leaders like uh, Nkrumah and others on the limits of formal ter territorial sovereignty. But, you know, the Great War of the 20th century was, in fact, a decolonial war, right? You saw decolonization sweep across the global south, but it never really... Uh, elevated to the scale of anti-imperialism. I think this is a point I want to emphasize is we have not really seen the struggle go beyond decolonization to anti-imperialism. Um, so anti-imperialism will require overturning those two legs, the monopoly control over economic capital and the monopoly control over military power on the international scale. And so what I'll remind people here is if you look at Fanon's opening chapter in Wretched the Earth, he ends that chapter with 10 pages or so talking about violence in the international context. The opening of the chapter, a lot of it is questions of violence in the settler colony. But he ends by saying this is not enough. You know, in another essay, when, he, when he's reflecting on the assassination of Lumumba, he, again, he is saying our mistake was not to raise our power up to the level of the international. The fight must happen at the international scale. Uh, and that's really where the commanding heights of sovereignty are. So how can subjugated states, subjugated peoples, elevate their struggle from that in a colony, in a one-to-one -one relation of overthrowing the immediate colonizer to overturning this broader imperialist world system, uh, which was missing in the 20th century struggles. And I, I believe we're, we're in a moment where it's being put to the question in a way it never has been before. I think the Palestinians with Al-Aqsa flood, what we're seeing with Yemen, what we saw with Iran yesterday, we're seeing that violence in the international context. We're seeing that application of greater force uh, at the international scale. Um, am I doing okay time-wise? I'm going to now move into Palestine. Okay. Well, maybe not immediately quite yet. I'm, I, so, okay, there's our theory. Now, now we'll have a little historical context on imperialism, but then I'll, I'll be integrating uh, Palestine uh, into this as well. So if we think historically around how this system has uh, unfolded, right? So I had that discussion of the uh, opium wars as an example. So we have British imperialism in the 19th century as I think the, the most consolidated form of capitalist imperialism up until that point, it's not the beginning of the capitalist imperialist system, but it does consolidate in such a way where the British are able to actually offer a form of collective leadership to other, what we might call sub-imperialist powers on the European continent that says, you know, the British control the flow of surplus value from the colonies, from the non-Western world into Europe, into the uh, United States, other countries in the West follow the British lead because they benefit from this, but this ultimately gives way to an inter-imperialist inter rivalry in the early 20th century as that other, comp other contradiction I emphasize, inter-firm competition and interstate competition puts a squeeze on profits, right? As Germany in particular starts to try to challenge British supremacy in the early 20th century because Germany reach a, reaches a limit in how much it can generate in terms of profits and accumulation, because it doesn't have the same access to non-Western wealth. So it seeks to acquire its own colonial territories, which what which, which, which leads to inter-imperialist war. Now, of course, Germany is defeated in World War I. And here um, you see the centrality of the subjugation of Palestine at this historical moment to the British imperialist project post uh, World War I. Um, in terms of it being a very valuable geostrategic region for the projection of imperialist power, uh, both against rising anti-imperialism from the peripheries, but in terms of holding also 
um, control over the hydrocarbon wealth that is being discovered at the time. Right. So British imperialism, uh, as is well known, is a fundamental power that backstops the initial Zionist colonization of Palestine. And this, this is, again, I know other speakers in the course have emphasized this. This is not because of some uh, Zionist deception of the British, but because the British imperialists recognize that the conquest of Palestine is essential to maintaining British imperialism of, over a core geostrategic region. Now, at this time, uh, something to introduce at this point of, of what I'm speaking about is that there are there's a segment of the Palestinian elite that seeks to appeal to the imperialists for recognition of Palestinian sovereign rights, right? But this is a mistake as Palestinian revolutionary thinkers like Ghassan Kanafani and even earlier, um, you know, revolutionaries like Azadin al Qassam, they make the point that, uh, you know, if you're begging those who have taken sovereign power away from you, who have imposed a greater force upon you, you seek recognition from those, that's a losing gambit, right? Because they will always have the power to encroach upon your land. And this is what essentially happens vis-a-vis -vis British imperialism in Palestine in the 1920s and into the 1930s. But this does lead though, obviously to the first uh, and, and, and uh, very historic articulation of Palestinian anti-imperialism, right? The great revolt of the 1930s is a rejection of the idea that the Palestinians can achieve sovereign recognition by trying to simply focus on that one-to-one -one relationship between the Palestinians and the Zionist settlers to defeat the Zionist settlers by appealing to British imperialism. Well, the Palestinian Great Revolt of the 1930s rejects this and actually seeks to challenge the military basis, the, 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 force, the force that is imposed upon Palestinians by taking up arms to reclaim sovereignty on a, on a, in a way that doesn't require recognition and dependence upon the imperialist powers. But the, what I wanted to uh, really, really focus on more uh, uh, as I move towards the end of the talk is the, the, folk, the, the contemporary context right, of Palestine. So historically, if it emerges in the setting of British imperialism, it is, it is um, to understand today, it's to understand Palestine's role in the system of US imperialism. So US imperialism is a, <coughs> and here again, I go to Samir Amin's essay, US imperialism in the Middle East, which is very, very clarifying and illuminating. US imperialism, uh, Amin argues, is very different than the pre-war imperialism. He says, here you have a system of imperialism that he calls that emerges, that's called, he calls collective imperialism or the imperialism of the triad. We're no longer in the space of an inter-imperialism or of a competitive imperialism. After World War II, the United States is the only force left standing and it has unrivaled military and economic supremacy. It seeks to control Europe. It seeks to control Japan. And Europe and Japan acquiesce to US leadership because they see a rising global south, uh, the, the rising peripheries due to the challenge um, raised through the um, decolonization struggle is challenging the entire imperialist system. So Amin argues this block then organizes on a collective basis to try to shut down the rising power of the South, try to manage the North-South relationship. But what is very key to understanding where we are today is that this collective imperialism itself enters a period, a period of contradictions in the 1970s. Okay, so in the 1970s, you have rising German and Japanese competition, declining U US competitiveness because of the contradictions of hyper US capitalism. You have declining competitiveness, you have increasingly rising challenges from developmental projects in the global south, in the Arab region and beyond, that's eating into the capacity of global north states to appropriate surplus value. So at this point, you have those contradictions I mentioned of capitalism intensifying. And we have, they have capitalism has not been able to overcome these contradictions from the 1970s. It has remained in an impasse since the 1970s. So this, the crisis of overaccumulation that's coming through rising inter-capitalist state competition, inter-firm competition, rising labor demands upon profits on capital in the core. These contradictions are sought to be overcome by the United States in the 1970s by switching from industrial capitalism to monopoly finance capitalism. Now, how does the United States actually um, put this in motion? Well, uh, this is where, of course, there's famously uh, Richard Nixon floating the dollar, removing the dollar from gold in order to remove any claims that are being made 
either by allies like the French or other countries upon the US, right? That the United States does not have the means to finance its consumption. So the you know, countries are calling in the dollar, asking for gold. Nixon links, delinks the dollar from gold and links instead the dollar to oil. And I think this is very significant that there is a strategy, uh, uh, there's an agreement that the United States makes with Saudi Arabia in 1974 to provide Saudi Arabia with a security umbrella, but under the agreement that Saudi Arabia will only sell its oil in dollars, in US dollars. And this is very, very fundamental to how the US overcomes the contradictions of the 1970s and seeks to discipline the rising power of global South states to reorient its surplus towards projects of national development and away from stabilizing the contradictions of the core. So there is a US-Saudi agreement that generates a financial power. And what I'll just mention briefly, and I'll come back to this uh, in a few moments, is that um, Zionism is key to this, right? So the United States, of course, post-1967, uh, is firmly in alliance with Zionism, even pre-1967, but especially post-1967 through the 67 war. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the Zionist state are key pillars that are uh, core to upholding this U.S. oil dollar relationship um, in the region. Right now, what are the, um, and this, uh, just briefly, I want to mention um, that the, a second response to the overaccumulation crisis, but beyond shifting to a financial strategy of accumulation, right? And I'll explain that financial strategy too, is a strategy of militarized accumulation. And I know you've had Ali Kadri on the uh, the course earlier, and I know his work is really excellent, but this also speaks back to Rosa Luxemburg's earlier, earlier work, that when capitalism enters a crisis of profitability of overaccumulation, it doesn't only turn to finance, it also turns to war. War not only is a means of generating control over resources, but war is a means of generating profits, right? And so I, I would invite people to explore the work of Kadri, but also the chapter in Luxembourg's uh, book on accumulation. Uh, I think the chapter on militarism, it's quite excellent. I think Matteo also has work he's done on this as well uh, that can speak to that. But I think the question uh, to understand Palestine and the imperialist system is to understand both that oil dollar relationship and also the system of militarized accumulation. Of course, we know Israel, uh, um, you know, is involved in testing weapons and in this system of high-tech military weapons development. And Luxembourg argues this is actually a fundamental way to regenerate profitability when there's a crisis in other sectors. So there is, this is a second strategy. Now, just to come back to that first one very quickly, the, the, um, the, this financial power that the United States constructs through the oil dollar relationship, this is key Right, both for the United States to resubjugate Europe, right? So now for Germany and Japan, uh, for its allies, for now for these countries to be able to purchase oil, they have to hold US dollars, right? So their capital is constantly returning back to New York. It's constantly returning back to Wall Street. Uh, and this allows the United States a way to skim off the top, to finance its consumptions, to finance its imports, even though it doesn't have the productive means to do so. It does so through this financial power, and this also hamstrings the development projects of the global south, right? We know the global south then enters a debt crisis through the oil price crisis of the 1970s. And the US uses this financial power then to impose structural adjustment on these states, which de-develops and underdevelops those states, right? So it re-intensifies the imperialist denial of sovereignty upon the global south. So this allows the United States to briefly had this belly pock moment where it seems as though it's able to contain the challenge of decolonization in the 20th century. It's able to contain the contradictions of capitalism through this strategy in the 1970s and 1980s. And this it seems as though this takes us, and this is what the capitalist imperialists project, to an end of history, right? In which the South has no choice but to integrate into capitalist markets on terms set by those who hold monopoly financial and military power the implications for Palestine at the time were, of course, being driven into the Oslo road, the Oslo framework in which um, the Palestinians are forced to uh, agree to disarm and to agree to a framework um, in which they actually end up losing more land, right? We see in South Africa, the post-apartheid set up. Um, but what was missed out on uh, at that time, and I think the work of Sam Moyo and Perisieros is very important here, is that although it seemed like there was an end of history, that this uh, overwhelming 
uh, monopoly power over military and financial um, uh, resources was definite and beyond contestation, um, that there was anti-imperialism being generated at the same time, right? There was something else happening in the 1980s as a challenge to this US order. Uh, now, Moyo and Yeros, what their work is, is they have an emphasis on reclaiming the land, right? That the, the land question, the question of armed struggle in challenging the military basis, that military leg of imperialism, that this was actually still in motion across the South. Many scholars missed this, is what Moyo and Yeros would argue. <laughs> but what I would emphasize is there are two, the two legs are also being challenged on, on both fronts, right? So in the 1980s, and I'm, I'm not going to get into this in detail, but I think many people misread what was happening in China in the 80s and 90s, but we can very clearly see that China launches a very fundamental challenge to the economic leg of imperialism by the 1980s, to the extent that by the 2000s, China's recycling surpluses back into the global South in a way that challenges the IMF and World Bank hold on imposing conditionalities. More fundamental in a way to what we're talking about today is the military leg. So the Iranian revolution in 1979 ends up constituting a fundamental challenge to that US-Saudi uh, arrangement in 1974. And I think we can recall the 1953 uh, coup d'etat in Iran, where the uh, fundamental uh, impetus of that uh, the coup was to maintain or to ensure that the flow of hydrocarbon oil wealth into and out of the region would not be lost, right? So there's an, the Iranian revolution is in of itself a fundamental challenge. Of course, we see uh, Hezbollah in 1982, if the PLO are defeated at the time and are driven out, we see Hezbollah rise up at that time and refuse to abdicate armed struggle. So we're seeing a military challenge to not just Zionist settler colonialism, but imperialism in the region also being launched at the time that we were being told that history is ending, right? And the, I think the, <laughs> the, the, the challenge posed by Hezbollah uh, you see as Oslo fails, as the demand that the PLO disarm and it leads to uh, the failure of Oslo for the Palestinians, the Hezbollah insistence on fighting force with force leads to the expulsion of Zionism from Lebanon, right? It leads to the expulsion of Zionism from Lebanon and it's important that we don't lose sight that again, and I think uh, Louis has done work on this in his, in, in his work with, with uh, Amal Saad, I'm sure he'll have more to say about this, that the relationship, it's not a proxy relationship, but the partnership between the Islamic Republic and Hezbollah was very fundamental to the expulsion of, um, of the Zionists from the region. So the, uh, the, the rising power of the, the anti-imperialist equation in the re region, right? It's first by the military challenge posed by um, Hezbollah to Zionism. And then this inspires, I think, the Palestinians to take up arms in the Second Intifada, to see that they have to return back to that primary leg of anti-imperialism, to challenge it on the relations of force. And then ultimately, I think the 2006 war is a really pivotal moment in changing the equation of the monopoly ownership over multi, uh, monopoly control or military force. Um, this is why, and this is where imperialism then returns as you see the end of history thesis being challenged by rising armed struggle in the region. We're seeing the basis of Zionism, of US imperialism being challenged. I think it's important to also recognize that in 2006, Hezbollah realizes that Zionism is not the primary contradiction. They realize it's the US imperialists who are really driving the 2006 summer war. Um, but the response by the imperialists to this rising challenge to the military leg is to impose economic sanctions on Iran and to declare Hezbollah uh, a terrorist organization. But here that second leg of anti-imperialism enters and it's very important because China is able to use its surpluses to help Iran uh, withstand um, sanctions. So, okay, I've, I've gone, I think a little too long. I'm gonna to try to bring this all together here. Um, I know it's been about 30 minutes. I said I was gonna be about 30 to 40 minutes. So let me, um, let me try to <coughs> start, start bringing this together. So I think one, one thing to, uh, I just wanted to emphasize though is so you have those two legs of imperialism. Uh, the region is very central to, to both of those legs, the US oil dollar complex in terms of the financial leg, military power enforcing that, but you have anti-imperialism in the form 
of the resistance being raised, raised out of Lebanon, but then how the Palestinians take that up vis-a-vis -vis the Second Intifada, but also in successive rounds of resistance in 2014 and 2021, they're increasingly showing that the Zionists are losing their deterrence capacity, but in motion with this broader axis of resistance that um, you know we will speak about more uh, in, in Louis' leg of the course today, um, the, the, you're seeing even U.S. imperialism unable to impose conditions via military force in Iraq and in Syria in the 2000s and into the 2010s. So you're seeing this rising military capacity to push back in Palestine and elsewhere in the region. Um, and imperialism is responding vis-a-vis -vis sanctions that I think the rise of China then contains but then the U.S. then again returns to the military leg to try to contain the rise of China. And I think this is how we have to understand in some levels the war on Libya in the 2000s, 2010, early 2010s, and the building up of AFRICOM bases on the African continent. This is an attempt to use military power to, to try to push back against what they view as a rising Chinese economic power that they cannot contain directly uh, for a range of reasons. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, what we've seen in the 2010s, it's been really difficult for imperialism to impose total, to impose that military equation in the way it had existed before. And I think the Yemen war is very crucial to this, that the, you know, the war in Yemen was an attempt to, um, to destroy a movement that wasn't simply about the national question in Yemen, but understood the national question in Yemen to be dependent upon, contingent upon the defeat of Zionism and the expulsion of imperialism from the region. And the failure of that proxy war is what opened up space for the Saudi-Iranian detente last year, where China steps in and basically shows to the Saudis, and of course the Saudis are still uh, very duplicitous and we don't know, uh, I mean, it's uh, you cannot count on um, uh, 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 what, which way they're going to go, but I think it was still significant that the resistance by Ansar Allah, their ability to defeat the Saudis in that war does open up space for a different regional order, the outlines of it to start to emerge, in which China basically proposes and shows that there's a, an ability to transition to a post-oil future, a, what the Chinese will call a developmental peace, right? And this developmental peace opens up more space for the resistance in the region, right? Because this strengthens Iran, it strengthens the resistance forces, it weakens Zionism. And the U.S. has countered the Saudi-Iranian detente by two mechanisms, by number one, trying to rapidly push for a push forth a Saudi uh, Israeli normalization framework that would permanently end the Palestinian question uh, and leave permanent Israeli sovereignty. So they're trying to uh, rapidly kind of accelerate um, uh, normalization, but they also gave carte blanche to uh, the Zionists over the past two years preceding October 7th. The Biden administration basically gives them carte blanche to accelerate land theft in the West Bank, to accelerate, uh, to intensify the siege, to accelerate um, the imprisonment of Palestinians. So of course we knew this was intensifying. We know the normalization is happening. And it's in this context, I think, that we have to understand Al-Aqsa flood uh, on October 7th and since then as a really decisive historic strike in terms of not just Palestinian national liberation, right, but it's a historic strike intervening into this, and, I'm, and I'm, I apologize for kind of rushing through the, the anti-imperialist moment of the past 20, 30 years, but I think it's a decisive strike into challenging those two legs uh, of imperialism, right? It's a decisive blow to the U.S. response to the end of the war on Yemen uh, that had been happening for those eight years it's a decisive blow to the military leg. They will never be able to restore that military deterrence. I think either Yemen has already struck a decisive blow. Al-Aqsa flood is a more fundamental strike. I don't think that they're ever gonna be able to uh, recover um, from this. This is why there was so much paranoia and outrage about what was uh, in terms of the atrocity propaganda that happens um, around Al-Aqsa flood. I think the... Um, the what we see with uh, Ansar Allah supporting the Palestinians since then, we're seeing in the Red Sea, we're seeing an explicit challenge to the commanding heights of sovereignty. Who controls the flow of capital into and out of the region? Right, we're seeing Ansar Allah put that question to test in a way it hasn't been put to test before. So I think um, I will maybe just uh, uh, close there in the sense that um, 
We have, I think, Alexa Flood. Uh, oh, well, maybe one final point is that not just Alexa Flood, but the rising armed resistance in the region has challenged fundamentally also that militarized pole of accumulation, right? That if the 1970s crisis intensifies war as a means of overcoming the crisis of profitability and accumulation in other sectors, we're seeing now the Palestinians, the Yemenis, the Iranians demonstrating that in fact, the Western military industrial complex is, is really not robust at all, right? It cannot, it cannot achieve military victories. It can allow for destructive impacts upon defenseless populations, but militarily, there are very limited objectives in what it can be shown to achieve. So I think Alexa flood is a decisive strike both against militarized accumulation, but also against that financialized regime that the US constructed uh, from the 1970s to today. This is why the United States is so invested in supporting this genocidal war, because everything is at stake, I think, for the US imperialist system in trying to restore a status quo, but they are going to fail in doing so. Um, I will stop there um, and I look forward to, to Louis' comments and um, the Q&A after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bikram. I mean, it's always, uh, don't worry too much. It's always a pleasure to be listening to you and uh, your analysis of the situation. Uh, just because of, uh, I'm going to use the metaphor here. First leg has been uh, Bikram. We move to the second leg of the lecture here. Uh, Louis, all day, another uh, comrade and intellectual uh, and, uh, and friend of this collective has put the, the lecture series together and obviously of Middle East Critique. Louis is a writer, editor, and historian. He has a PhD in history. He's the founding editor of Liberated Text, which we're going to, I'm, I'm sure Sam has already linked or we're going to link it in the chat. A book reviewing and publishing project dedicated to reviewing and republishing works that have been neglected, overlooked, and suppressed in the mainstream since their publication. He's also the editor of this issue for Palestine Web Magazine, which we have already linked in the in the chat. Louis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matteo. Um, can everyone hear me? Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction, Matera, uh, and thank you, Assam, and thank you, Bikram, uh, and generally thank you to Middle East Critique. Uh, I'm honored to be a, a part of this lecture series, which I think is doing um, really important uh, work, actually. Um, and I, I, I think and hope what I'm going to speak about today matches actually quite well, um, kind of complements Bikram's, because it it very much accepts the same um, kind of analytical and ideological frame but looks at things from a slightly different perspective and kind of it's a more specific uh, and focused uh, instance of the way in which these um, forces and counter forces are, are relevant at this exact juncture. Um, so I have spoken and written previously uh, about some of the limitations uh, and problems of the Palestine solidarity movement in the West, um, including its frequent dismissal of the Palestinians' right to armed struggle, and its uh, common propensity to divorce the Palestinian cause from its regional and actually its, its global context, um, essentially to divorce it from the context that, that Bikram has just out, uh, outlined so, so well. Um, and so because of that, very often Palestine is, dis is discussed in, in Western solidarity circles in a kind of abstract manner that obscures not only the central role of US imperialism uh, and the Zionist entity's relationship to it, but also indirectly or directly frequently actually opposes and demonizes the very countries and forces that materially assist the Palestinian resistance, namely the respective members of the axis of resistance. Um, and this, you know, everything that is being discussed today has, for obvious reasons, come very sharply into focus over the last 24 hours, as if it wasn't already. Um, and I just I saw something earlier, which is an extremely striking example of, of exactly the kind of unfortunate um, phenomenon of which I'm referring. So the head of the um, the UK Palestine Solidarity Campaign uh, tweeted this morning um, something that epitomizes this this attitude that I I would argue. Um, is not actually seriously invested in or interested in the actual liber liberation of Palestine um, and is essentially anti-imperialist. Anti um, and he said, 
<clears throat> I quote, Netanyahu has, has sought a direct war with Iran for years and provoking this wider conflict will give him cover to continue the genocide in Gaza. Iran's tyrannical rulers bear responsibility for their own illegitimate actions and launching an assault that risks wider conflagration. So he packs several, several disingenuous, misleading and just dishonest talking points into just a few lines there. Uh, and, it, you know, obviously anything I'm talking about in this regard, there are exceptions and there, there are admirable exceptions. But this kind of attitude, you know, this kind of language, tyrannical rulers, etc., indistinguishable really from from the State Department is unfortunately common in, like I say, not all, but a lot of uh, solidarity circles uh, in the West. And today I want to talk about something specific that kind of connects, highlights, and underlines all of these various strands, uh, and for over a decade now has played a very negative and corrosive impact um, generally on the Palestine Solidarity Movement in the West, as well as the anti-war movement generally, uh, namely Syria uh, and the proxy war against it waged by the US and its European and regional allies. Um, I will talk about the reality of that war itself today to some extent, but on the topic uh, of that war specifically, and especially the historical context required fully to understand it, um, I would recommend reading Patrick Higgins' uh, excellent article, Gunning for Damascus, which I know some of you, if you were on the call yesterday, Patrick spoke yesterday and that article was uh, was posted, I think. Um, but yeah, an article from last year by Patrick Higgins called Gunning for Damascus, the US War on the Syrian Arab Republic. Uh, I would highly recommend reading that. Um, so contrary to the dominant narrative in the West, which habitually downplays, if not outright conceals or, just, or fundamentally distorts the central role of US imperialism. In short, um, as just an example, as Ali Qadri and Lina Matar put in the introduction to their edited volume, uh, Syria from National Independence to Proxy War, which again, I would recommend. Syria, I quote, as a country whose obliteration would leverage US Israeli power over the region, underwent an imperialist assault before and during the Arab Spring to tear it asunder. Bringing democracy to Syria or anywhere else via US imperialism is not a serious proposition, end quote. Qadri and Matar's book provides very crucial context and political clarity that is sorely missing from the majority of academic work on Syria. Uh, and notably because of the extent to which it looks in close and actually often quite scathing detail at the market oriented reforms that were initiated in Syria in the 2000s, it can certainly not be dismissed seriously as a whitewash or, or one-sided. Um, I would assume most of the audience is already aware of this, but just to kind of reiterate at this point, you know, th though Syria has faded from the headlines, it feels important to point out here that, number one, large swathes of Syrian territory, crucially where its oil and uh, wheat fields are located, remain occupied by the US military and its local proxies. Number two, the, co the country is subject to suff suffocating economic warfare in the form of sanctions designed specifically to deny it the chance of post-war recovery and to inflict mass suffering on its population. Number three, Western-backed, um, rebranded Al-Qaeda contra-type forces remain in control of Idlib in the north and still, although on a lesser scale, periodically attack, including recently uh, in collaboration with uh, Israel. And perhaps most significantly for the purposes of this talk today and this, this moment in which we're speaking in, uh, the Golan Heights remain colonized by the Zionist entity, which simultaneously and on a regular basis bombs elsewhere inside Syria, including both its major civilian airports. And of course, as I'm sure we all know, and is extremely relevant uh, on today of all days, last week, the Iranian consulate in Damascus, or two weeks ago now. And in fact, this attack against an Iranian diplomatic building inside Syrian territory uh, which is actually reminiscent of uh, the assassination, assassination of uh, Qasem Soleimani on Iraqi soil in 2020, it really exemplifies the relevance um, and importance of discussing Syria and this topic at this juncture, uh, not only in the context of Israel's genocidal, uh, ongoing genocidal assault on, on Gaza, but also in light of uh, what happened last night. So killed in that attack, along with several others, was Mohammed Reza Zahdi, uh, a senior commander of the IGC's Quds Force. Um, after his assassination, again, it's just an example of a, of a, of a broader phenomenon, um, Hamas's Al-Qassam brigades issued a statement of mourning 
in which it thanked Zahedi Hadi for his role in building the resistance front over several years, and specifically for what it called his prominent role uh, in operation at Laksa Flood. Similarly, a senior PFLP official, Abu Ahmed Bouad, describes uh, Hadi's killing as a loss for the, I quote, as a loss for the axis of resistance and the Palestinian people, and stated that Zahedi had been focused on, quote, mobilizing all resources towards resistance. And furthermore, that he had been coordinating with relevant parties to deliver weapons to Gaza, as well as working on developing the resistance capabilities in the West Bank. Now, these pronouncements are extremely typical of repeated public statements made by prominent figures and spokespeople from among the unified Palestinian factions, including but not limited to Hamas, uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and the PFLP, as well as uh, Hezbollah as well, in which they openly and repeatedly acknowledge and thank the various other members of the axis of resistance, including, crucially in this context, the Syrian government, for their financial, logistical, and technical help in developing the Palestinian resistance and its military capabilities you know, the, the, the military leg out, outlined by Bikram previously. Uh, this is something which Hamas's leader in Gaza, Yahya Sanwar, has been particularly vocal and explicit about on several occasions, notably uh, since the Battle of Saif al-Quds in 2021, in which um, he was particularly prominent, even giving into some interviews to uh, foreign press and being very explicit about those forces who had helped and were helping uh, Hamas and the Palestinian resistance generally, uh, I remember in, in Sinwar's own words, you know, with, with no conditions. Um, and similarly, thus far, those same, those same groupings have reacted uh, in an equatable manner um, to Iran's attacks last night, um, thanking them for, for their support and for the role that Iran plays. But in spite of these like I say, very much commonplace statements and interviews, um, which I should say are, you know, primarily obviously given in Arabic. Um, and though, again, not uh, without exception, there is a stark disconnect often between uh, English language and, Ar and uh, Arabic language discourse, even amongst um, kind of broadly defined solidarity circles. But in spite of these uh, repeated statements, in solidarity circles in the West, especially those, I would say, in or adjacent to academia, the axis of resistance is commonly ignored, belittled, or dismissed. Uh, and if spoken about, it's usually referred to as the supposed uh, or self-styled axis of resistance, uh, implying that there is, there is, it either doesn't exist or it's a cynical ploy, uh, Palestinians are often referred to as being used by the Axis as pawns uh, and similarly kind of um, pejorative labels that basically imply that they don't have any agency uh, in, the, in those relationships. Um, when, when the Axis non-state members are acknowledged, they are routinely portrayed as Iranian proxies. Uh, and this is done in order to generate justification for for further belligerent stance against Iran, and obviously it delegitimizes the actions of um, these non-state members as supposedly somehow being part of a, a kind of dastardly Iranian plot for domination, rather than based on their own legitimate uh, aspirations and political priorities. And as Bikram mentioned in in uh, the opening, uh, Amal Saad in particular has done important work on why this this sponsor proxy model is completely inappropriate. Um, not only in the case of Iran and Hezbollah, on which she particularly focuses, but in fact on the axis as a whole, uh, in which each member has significant autonomy from Iran, in spite of it, you know, undeniably, and I don't think any, anyone within the axis would deny this, it being the largest and the most significant material backer of the alliance. Um, on the Iran-Hezbollah relationship specifically, I would recommend reading uh, Challenging the Sponsor Proxy, sponsor proxy Model, uh, the, Isra the Iran Hezbollah relationship, which is by uh, Amal Saad. Um, the axis, therefore, has basically, you know, it was already an elephant in the room in many discussions before October the 7th. But it is now more so, more than ever, uh, especially, I mean, I, I was going to say that anyway, but especially in light of, of, of yesterday. And those unwilling or unable to discuss it while sim simultaneously taking up space, talking about and analyzing the current situation, are actually doing a major, major 
um, disservice to anyone who genuinely wants to understand what is happening and why. Uh, you know, and I think in some cases that reluctance to talk is is more uh, conniving. Sometimes it's more out of cowardice. Sometimes it's more out of um, you know fears for employment, etc. Um, but whatever the reason, uh, it is a glaring, glaring omission from discussions. And as just just as an example of that, I was told a few days ago that a panel entitled "Imperialism and Resistance in the Arab World." Uh, at a large conference that was held in the US last week, did not mention the axis of resistance once, um, which is just, you know, it's it's laughable, frankly. Um, and according to someone else who attended that, that conference, the axis was not actually mentioned throughout the entire conference so far as they could see. Um, and with regards to Syria specifically, it's a kind of related um, form of glaring emission that has contributed towards widespread ignorance of the fact that central to understanding the last decade, or in fact, more than the last decade, is that one of the primary reasons behind, you know, not the sole, but one of the main reasons for the imperialist proxy war that was launched against Syria was because of its role within the resistance axis as a crucial conduit for arm transfers to Hezbollah and beyond onto, the, onto Palestinian factions its provision of other forms of assistance and, and support, including direct, direct military aid, its hosting of the political leaderships of more than one political faction in Damascus, and generally its decades long support for the Palestinian cause and its adamant refusal to normalize relations with Israel, unlike Egypt and others. And it, uh, it should be acknowledged here, I think that there have been times at which the Palestinian cause um, was subordinated, let's say to Syria's own perceived self-interests um, notably its actions against the PLO in Lebanon in 1976. But those critics who treat such examples as illustrative of the entirety of Syrian Palestinian relations are providing a deeply misleading and I think ultimately false interpretation of that relationship and its history and are frequently uh, just acting in, in, in bad faith. Um, now the aggression against Syria was a means by which it could be removed <clears throat> or at least majorly limited as a factor in regional equations to the benefit of uh, the US and Israel. Um, Hezbollah Secretary General Saeed Hassan Nasrallah spoke about this uh, explicitly uh, in a clip in um, in 2012. Um, in fact, can I can I play that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you share? Yeah. Okay. You can do that, right? Yeah, just yeah, yeah. Cool. One second. I think it's worth. <clears throat> Is that working? If you yes. could increase your volume a little bit. Uh, yeah. So the context to this clip is Nasrallah, and bear in mind, this is only, this is only 2012. So the, 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 the conflict has only been, it's, it's relatively young, uh, but he's talking about the desire of uh, the West um, and its regional allies, their desire to continue the fighting to avoid any kind of political solution um and as you'll see the, the the reasons why that is the case i probably won't play the whole clip but i'll just play a little bit المزيد من القتل في الجيش العرب السوري والأجهزة الأمنية السورية المزيد من القتل في فئات الشعب السوري المختلفة تعني سوريا ضعيفة سوريا هزيلة سوريا مدمرة سوريا مستنزفة انشطبت من المعادلة الأقليمية هذا مصلحة مين؟ أمريكا وإسرائيل اليوم بالاعتبار الاستراتيجي بالاعتبار ال... So that he goes on, but that gives you an idea. Uh, one of the the key um, aims was, in effect, even if, uh, and as as did turn out to be the case, even if um, the Syrian government was not successfully uh, fully overthrown, 
uh, and we had uh, and we're leading to a kind of post 2003 Iraq scenario that the fighting would be so damaging, so all consuming um, that Syria would be massively weakened and um, so preoccupied with its own internal problems that its role within the resistance axis would uh, be limited, if not entirely removed. Um, over a decade later, though Syria still plays a part. It is severely weakened and its role is limited. Uh, and this has been admitted and spoken about by other leaders within the resistance axis who have noted that, you know, I would say an almost kind of defense, defensive way that people need to be realistic about how um, how prominent a role Syria is currently in a position to play. Um, but having said that, just by virtue of um, allowing uh, it to be used as both a land and air route uh, makes it a fundamental cog within the, within the axis, just just that alone. Um, and you know, I think it's extremely telling that whereas Jordan last night was intercepting Iran's missiles, Syria, I've read reports that Syria was in was should should try to at least trying to, but I think maybe successfully shooting down Israel's interceptions, uh, as well as obviously allowing um, its airspace to be used um, as part of the attack. Um, and, you know, obviously these things are, are, are not insignificant. Um, and it should be mentioned here that the, the US has obviously, in manifold ways, uh, consistently tried to weaken and divide all those forces in the region that are opposed to Israel. And they've used a range of means, including, you know, figurative uh, carrots, it's not just sticks, um, such as its 2001 offer to Hezbollah for improved relations uh, and removal from State Department terror lists if it would sever ties with Syria, Hamas, uh, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, Hezbollah rejected the offer. Um, Nasrallah said it would be rejecting the, Hezbollah's uh, heart and head. Um, and interesting, you know, just as Ansar Allah, it's been reported, have rejected a very similar offer from the US in, in recent days, um, specifically the removal of terror lists. Um, so, you know, the U.S. is is constantly trying different different means to try and um, to try and break up and weaken this alliance. Uh, and, you know, likewise, an additional reason and related, obviously, to, to what I already said, but an additional reason uh, for the U.S. proxy war on Syria was an attempt to sever it from Iran. Uh, it's the U.S. National Security Advisor said explicitly in 2011, I quote, the end of the Assad regime would constitute Iran's greatest setback in the region, a strategic blow that will further shift the balance of power in the region against it. So again, they're very explicit about these things, or periodically uh, to certain audiences, they are explicit, at least anyway. Uh, I'll talk about the way in which uh, the proxy war was publicly spoken about and portrayed. Um, in 2012, I think around the same time as that uh, Nasrallah clip, um, Amal Saad wrote a very prescient article in the now unfortunately defunct uh, Al Akhbar English, um, in which she argued that to support the Syrian government at that juncture was in, effect, was in effect to support Palestine because, I quote, Syria had become the new front line of the war between empire and those resisting it. This article was greeted with a lot of uh, opprobrium um, from supposed uh, allies. Um, including many people that she was criticizing essentially and she was criti criticizing so-called third way intellectual forces um, that opposed both the main uh, opposition umbrella group at the time the Syrian National Council um, because it's over US uh, Israeli NATO backing um, but simultaneously rejected and opposed the Syrian government and Saad uh, argued that this third way campaign only served quote the strategy and interests of the US and Israel who have made no secret of the fact that his, i.e. Uh, Bashar al-Assad's, fall would help them achieve their wider strategic ambitions of weakening Iran and resistance forces in Lebanon and Palestine. Um, it was a very prescient uh, and at the time um, brave article to write that I think has been, yeah, like I say, proven very, very prescient. Um, at the time that uh, she was writing that, Israel had not yet struck uh, Syria directly as part of that aggression. Uh, that began in 20, 2011. Um, but I think it's very important to understand the extent to which Israel has played and continues to play a very direct and, and willing role in the war on Syria. Um, 
and that conflict um which it it, it termed i can't remember who but in in kind of israeli discourse it was referred to as a battle a battle between wars um and in a recent piece in in the cradle uh lebanese journalist khalil nasrallah um writes at length about israel's role uh, and notably how it's failed to achieve its objectives, especially uh, its desire to limit the flow of advanced weaponry to, to Hezbollah. Uh, and I'll just quote a little bit of, um, or paraphrase some of uh, Nasrallah's article because it's very pertinent. So Israel initiated the battle between wars uh, with a number of aims which he outlines. The first, preventing the transfer of game-changing weapons to Hezbollah, uh, and then such as uh, precision armaments, air defense systems, etc., disrupting the supply route to the Lebanese resistance, i.e. through Syria, as I mentioned, undermining the Syrian army's armament and capabilities, keeping Iran away from occupied Palestine's borders and establishing a, quote, security belt extending 40 to 80 kilometers into the occupied Syrian Golan. Um, to try and achieve these objectives, uh, Israel's involvement in the campaign kind of unfolded in, in stages, um, initially involved coordinating with and supporting armed groups that will, that also had the support of the US and, and several of the, the Arab Gulf states. Um, and they tried to gain control over southern Syria and dismantle Syrian air defense units, which again, if we place this in the context of, of last night, it's not hard to see why this is, this is so central. Um, the Israel's involvement became more direct in January 2013, um, when the Israeli Air Force bombed a scientific research center um, just somewhere outside of, of Damascus. Um, and since then, Israel has repeatedly violated Syria's sovereignty, uh, conducted hundreds uh, of air operations against um, various uh, sites, people, uh, civilian airports, scientific research centers, um, a long list of, of uh, quote unquote targets. Um, and obviously the most salient right now is the one that took place on April the 1st. Um, so this imperialist aggression on Syria, of which Israel was, was a central part, has been ongoing for more than a decade now. And it has simultaneously, although I would say the, it has died down somewhat in tone, it's been accompanied throughout by an incredibly broad, multifaceted, emotionally manipulative, and complex propaganda campaign. Um, and this campaign propagated several myths, um, too many to discuss uh, today in detail, um, often including the completely false idea that the West had either not inter intervened at all uh, or had not done so sufficiently. Um, and it relied on a cartoonish, deliberately simplistic portrayal uh, of the entirety of the Syrian state as one ostensibly evil and bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty dictator. And obviously, I mean, probably goes without saying, but everything outlined um, by Bikram um, certainly was not included in any, um, any mainstream coverage. Um, but as I learned at the time, to my disappointment and surprise, um, even within supposed radical quote unquote left wing, quote unquote left um, academic and other spaces, um, there was also no space allowed for that kind of discussion. And on the contrary, anti-imperialism or being an anti-imperialist, um, still now, but especially at you know very intense periods of propaganda that related to events on the ground, such as uh, Aleppo in 2016, anti-imperialist was used as, a, as an outright insult, basically. And anyone who dared to oppose or even actually just kind of politely question the dominant narrative uh, that was pushed was immediately slandered and attacked. Um, I think to I think even those of us who were kind of active and aware of that at the time, I think sometimes it became forgotten the extent to which that was the case and how restrictive and controlling um, the that environment was. Um, as I wrote in a 2016 article in, in Monthly Review called Controlling the Narrative on Syria, and I quote, a set of core arguments are used to denounce those who question the dominant narrative. They include the notion that it's somehow Islamophobic to criticize the actions of rebel groups or to label them as extremists, and that to highlight the central role of US imperialism in the conflict is or orientalist 
as it denies Syrians their agency. Often legitimate criticism is simply dismissed outright as fascist, Stalinist, Putinist, or all three. The policing of acceptable opinion in this way has a simple and practical function, to foster a climate in which people feel too intimidated to speak out, thus allowing the dominant narrative to remain unquestioned, so that, crucially, it continued, can continue to be utilized to generate public support for further Western intervention in Syria. Um, though it was already evident at, at the time, it is now even clearer that this line was enforced by very deliberate, very organized networks comprised of academics, journalists, think tankers, uh, NGO employees, um, many of whom, even if, even if they um, still talk about Syria, almost overnight moved on to bullying people into um, in for, taking the mainstream line on Ukraine, for example. Uh, and as I say, they're often using outright bullying uh, and intimidation tactics. Um, so unsurprisingly, after I wrote that piece in 2016, I was labelled many of the things that I pointed out people uh, were labelled. Um, and around a year after that, myself and several other academics uh, were attacked um, by the Times, uh, described as acidists working in UK universities and calling for, for us to be sacked. Um, I mentioned this not to kind of garner personal sympathy, but simply as a, a personal example of that environment and how the imperialist narrative was, was enforced. Um, and this, this, this aspect is really a topic that could be spoken about for hours, um, you know, extended to Hollywood with the white helmets, the transparent creation of, of Western intelligence agencies that worked solely with Al-Qaeda, you know, winning an Oscar. Um, I think it's important to note here that Al Jazeera played a very prominent role in this propaganda, uh, a role that is ongoing to some extent, for example, in its coverage of Idlib. And I think Al Jazeera's positionality and stance um, definitely needs to be taken into consideration given their um, prominence in the in the the current situation, which obviously has been extremely important and superior to to many Western um, or to all um, mainstream Western channels. But it still does perform a certain certain function vis-a-vis -vis, uh, U.S. imperialism and you know obviously the the Qatari state, and I think that needs to be obviously remembered. You know, some of some of their coverage during those crucial years in Syria was especially uh, Al Jazeera Arabic uh, was extremely, almost unbelievably sect sectarian. Um, the other thing that I wanted to speak about, again, without elaborating on too much, is the extremely damaging role of, you know, I don't really like the term, but the left broadly defined throughout those years of war, um, which habitually um served up an ana analysis virtually indistinguishable from the state department but used kind of leftist terminology and framing and was published by ostensibly left-wing and radical publishing houses there are far too many examples of this phenomenon to look at in detail today um but i'll just pick out a couple of, of the most egregious um maybe the most egregious is um robin yasin kasab um who if you don't know who that is he has he wrote um what in many leftist circles you know it's on all the reading lists etc is the kind of one of the go-to books um on syria published by pluto press and in fact republished by pluto press a year or two after it initially came out um yasin kasab is a and i do not use these words lightly he's a sectarian reactionary fascist um the piece that I wrote in 2016, controlling uh, the narrative on Syria, I looked at him um, partic in particular. If you're interested or you're intrigued to what extent he is those things, I would recommend reading that. And you know, he, he has not um, he has not stopped um, in taking those kind of positions since then. In the eight years since then, um, another person who was particularly damaging and, and prominent in this was uh, Gilbert Ashar. Um, you know, a, a very prominent uh, Trotskyist Marxist academic whose argument, and I'm not even particularly paraphrasing, whose argument was essentially it was all the, what happened in Syria was all Obama's fault because he didn't sufficiently arm the rebels. Uh, and, you know, I, I always remember he, he described US support for the rebels as like a joke. And that was only weeks after it had been reported that the CIA was funneling bin, billions. Uh, to these groups. Um, 
And he was one of those, not the only one, but one of those who wrote an article called The Anti-Imperialism of Fools. Um, and actually, Patrick Higgins wrote a very good response. I can't remember if it was specifically to Ashar's piece, but there was there was a flurry of a flurry of articles explaining why the anti-imperialist position on Syria was racist, wrong, evil, bloodthirsty, etc. Um, but Patrick said, I quote, if the US and Israel are the, <clears throat> the are the chief causes of under underdevelopment in the region, in brackets, and they are then to protect resistance pockets against their project and to prevent their adm advancement is not, quote, the anti-imperialism of fools, it is just anti-imperialism. Um, there's always, again, there are so many examples that could be chosen, but a very stark example of just how sectarian, warmongering and reactionary ostensibly left-wing left, left -wing figures were. Um, there is a quote, uh, sorry, not quote, uh, interview that um, the UK journalist Owen Jones gave, um, which I believe was in, I actually can't remember the year, um, but he's interviewing Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, who, if you don't know who that is, is a kind of comically right-wing, elitist, um, conservative, um, small and uh, large C um, politician who... As you, I'll, I'll, I'll share this as well. It's, it's only very short. Um, who, as you shall, shall see, Owen Jones, the supposedly left-wing, you know, alternative journalist, is in fact far to the right of uh, of the Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, one second. And again, I show I, sh I, sh I show this because it's illustrative of a broader phenomenon, not solely to. Uh, to criticize a specific individual. Most civilians in Syria, in fact, the overwhelming number are killed by the Assad regime. They drop barrel bombs on civilians, which in one sweep can kill as many people as killed in the Paris, despicable Paris attacks committed by ISIS. Do you really think that is an improvement to support to end up with a situation where raising that actually kills more people. Uh, I mean, I, 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 so here he's he's clearly arguing the Assad regime quote is is worse than ISIS. I think Assad is a, unquestionably a very evil man, but regrettably, our efforts to uh, enforce regime change in other countries have made things worse rather than better. But the issue surely is that the Sunni population constitute the majority in Syria. They fear Assad more than they fear ISIS, and it's very difficult to see how you can have a peaceful resolution to this horrific sickening civil war unless you have a government that has the confidence of the Sunnis, otherwise they'll, they'll go they won't love ISIS, but they'll prefer to stick with them rather than... There are no easy answers. I'll stop there. He's, a, you know, just overtly saying the Sunni population of Syria prefer ISIS to, uh, to Assad, um, which was, believe it or not, uh, I'm sure many of people will remember an unfortunately um, common refrain amongst supposedly uh, left-wing uh, pundits and, and analysts. Um, so the war on Syria, as I said, it not only weakened Syria itself in the ways that I've described, uh, and as a result, the axis of resistance to an extent, um, as predicted by Nasrallah in, 20, in uh, 2012, Syria became bogged down in an internal conflict, but it is still, and you know, as last night showed, it is still a member of the axis of resistance and performing a very crucial function within that alliance. Um, it also caused a rupture, which again, I haven't had time to talk about. It caused a rupture between Hamas and Syria, um, which wasn't fully resolved until 2022. Uh, but again, that is now, uh, there has been a reconciliation on that front. But in addition to the to the damage that the proxy war uh, imposed on Syria itself, it also did, has done damage to the Palestine Solidarity Movement, uh, I think pushing it further and further away uh, from anti-imperialist analysis, likewise the anti-war war movement generally in the West, um, through creating ruptures and damaging arguments. Um, and, I don't, and, I, and I don't think this happened entirely organically, I think this was deliberate as well. Uh, and it has led to confusion and, and incoherency in analysis and public positions, divorcing it from anti-imperialism 
um, and the centrality of the Palestinian cause to the issue of imperialism and development in the Arab world uh, in its in its entirety, you know, as exemplified by the that quote I, I opened with from the head of the UK Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Um, I want to end talk to quote something that I came across uh, in the last couple of months, um, which is a speech that the Lebanese communist intellectual Hussein Rouhi uh, gave in the mid 1980s. Um, well, actually, I won't go into it. He wrote, but did not end up actually giving the speech, but he wrote the speech. And he wrote the speech when he was asked um, to be given a, a, an award by the Palestinian Journalists Union. Um, and I want to read some of the words from his speech because they are especially pertinent right now. So he wrote, when we, when we refer to the Palestinian cause, we might very well be referring to that of Lebanon or any other Arab country and vice versa. When we mention the Lebanese resistance, we might very well be referring to the Palestinian resistance and vice versa. The cause is the same because the meaning is the same. The content of all is one. It should not be said that we seek to erase national specificities and to impose uniformity, no. Specificities cannot be erased by anyone's will and uniformity is impossible. But the question of Arab national liberation is absolutely shared by every, every Arab country. The Arab-Israeli struggle absolutely belongs to every part of Arab lands. The cause of liberating Palestine is the absolute basis of all Arab struggles. The contradictions between the ambitions of progressive pan-Arab nationalists and those of US and Israeli imperialism is what is produced by our present historical condition. The contradiction is apprehended by Arab consciousness as a cause that not only takes precedence, but also subordinates all other secondary contradictions of each country of the Arab homeland, i.e. as a cause to which every other internal Arab contradiction is absolutely subordinated. Marui's words are as pertinent now as they were then. The Palestinian resistance, represented by Hamas and the unified factions, including the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, are now in close alliance with the Lebanese resistance, Hezbollah, who, incidentally, uh, Hezbollah was once described by the PFLP's founder, George Habash, as the, the crowning achievement of our bitter and bloody experiences. Um, as well as with the other members of the Axis resistance, including the Syrian government that managed to survive the war launched against it. Hezbollah's Secretary General, Said Hassan Nasrallah, has consistently stressed the centrality of the Palestinian cause to the future of not only Lebanon, but also the entire region. And the party's martyrs are mourned as having died on the path to Jerusalem. Likewise, uh, Iran's Al-Quds force is called Al-Quds, Jerusalem. Um, these slogans or these names exemplify the enduring relevance of uh, Rui's analysis and the continued existence of a cross-ideological movement that, in his words, understands that the cause of liberating Palestine is the absolute basis of all Arab struggles, subordinate to all other issues and internal contradictions. Obviously, Murua is talking just about uh, Arab struggles and Iran's role uh, kind of complicates that to an extent. Um, but I think the salient point in this context is that Murua's position and his argument now seems to be overwhelmingly supported by public opinion throughout the Arab world. A region-wide uh, poll that was conducted in January of, January of this year found that 92% of all respondents believed that, quote, the Palestinian cause is a cause for all Arabs and not the Palestinian people alone. Now, obviously the implications of this, in addition to uh, extremely recent events, uh, are gonna be far reaching uh, and, uh, the almost unanimous nature of that belief, you know, makes a mockery of those in the West who have, who have dared to argue that the Palestinian cause no longer matters in the Arab world. Um, and there's no doubt it would be a source of great concern to both Israeli and Western leaders um, as yet another indication that the long-term viability uh, of the Zionist settler state is seriously endangered. Um, there are many ang angles and kind of trajectories which I could have um, followed um, but I think the salient point or one of the salient points with regards to the current moment and Syria is literally, you know, last night, Syria has demonstrated the centrality of its role uh, within the axis of resistance. And given the propaganda campaigns uh, of the last decade plus, um, 
those of us who really are invested in and believe and want the liberation of Palestine um, need to be aware of those who played uh, a role or continue to play a role in that in that demonization and that propaganda campaign against the Syrian government uh, and watch out for what their role could be uh, as things develop from this point. Um, you know, some people have already revealed themselves, I think, in the, in the reaction to last night's events, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Louis, thank you so much for uh, this uh, dive into the necessity and uh, of understanding the, the Western-led uh, aggression over Syria and its connection to Palestine. We already have uh, some questions, and considering the time, I want to jump into them right away. I think there is the first one by Craig that really connects very well to, to what Bikram was talking about. Although, Louis, I mean, if you want to comment on that, feel free to do that. But I'm just going to post this first to Brick Room because I think the second question by Fionn, it's very much related to you instead. So, Brick Room, basically, Craig is asking you to comment on the failure of Operation Prosperity Guardian, you know, the US-led naval coalition uh, aimed at securing uh, the Red Sea. What do you think are the implications in relation to the free flow of capital and commodities that, you know, that the US has not been able to, to control and to project its force? over Ansar Allah? That's a, that's a great question. And it's one that I alluded to um, as I rushed through the end of my my my, my talk at the end there. Um, I think it's it's a question that I don't think is the immediate question that arises because it's obviously Ansar Allah, Yemen. The response has been um, uh, an attempt to actually claim to enforce international law, right? And I'll, I'll just briefly mention on this point because it relates to the, the third question in the Q&A, but... Uh, you know, Amin, in, in his, the article I referenced, U.S. imperialism and the Middle East, he does he does clarify that, you know, international law can be a very good thing, right? Like a, like the U.S. rejected it after World War II. Like there was a there was a desire to establish this. But we see in Yemen an, an attempt to impose, right, like some sort of order upon those who are acting out uh, with genocidal violence, right? That seemed to be the, that's like the first, I think, um, issue at play in, in Yemen's response is, to impose costs to end the impunity that Zionism has been granted and that U.S. imperialism operates with. But what we're seeing, and I think Craig's question is very um, uh, on point here, we are seeing uh, that this is a fundamental challenge. Actually, it's showing the limits of U.S. military force to actually secure global capitalism. Right? It's, it's showing that 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 the question that I that. The point I raised at the beginning, that imperialism under capitalism is about sovereign power over the flow of capital into and out of the region in order to establish relations of dependency, in order to constrain policy autonomy, in order to generate the flow of surplus value in particular directions, which leads to the dull compulsion, so quote unquote, quote marks, that leads to de-development and underdevelopment in particular regions. So what are we seeing with Ansar Allah? We are seeing a capacity, to, uh, a force capacity that shows that the United States doesn't have the ability to actually protect and control, because like Arigi calls it a protection racket, that the U.S. says, right? Like uh, we're going to skim off the top of all economic production, even from our allies, um, because if you don't, we're going to punish you. But we can't. Well, but we're going to say we're going to protect you. Well, here they're showing they cannot do that. They do not have the capacity to do so. Um, and uh, just a point on that, I think that's a really uh, crucial point for people to understand in relation to the entire axis. You know, this has been, uh, if you read U.S. military journals, if you read Zionist journals, you will see that they are very clear that Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Ansar Allah, the Iranian state, these are learning organizations, right? That in each round of fighting, they've clearly further developed and refined, and the article I wrote for, for Louis and Ab, I, I emphasize this as too, they further refine and develop their tactics, right? So the U.S. bombs Yemen, but they can't get to the source of Yemen's military power. Right. They cannot get to the way that they, they're never going to be able to get to because Yemen over the years has developed the capacity to develop its weapons in an endogenous way that is beyond U.S. capacity to hit its storage and production facilities. Right. Uh, this is hybrid armies. They're both guerrilla but formalized. Right. And I think that's the same same case with Hezbollah, with Qassam brigades, uh, with the Iranians, whereas the imperialists they have actually been weakening in terms of their military capacity over the years. They have been the hubris with which they have slaughtered people in Iraq, in Libya and elsewhere, defenseless populations, 
has led to an actually weakening of their actual military capacity to actually engage military force against other military actors. So I think there is clearly a demonstration that the U.S. does not possess the force capacity to be able to enforce sovereign power over um, capital flowing into and out of the region. Now, this is really pivotal. Right? This is pivotal because it's through the Red Sea that goods will traverse from Asia through Europe. Right? So this is actually the uh, a real key node, a real key dynamic in the broader capitalist system, just like the South China Sea is. Right? So these are key points that the U.S. seeks to uh, militarize and um, uh, enforce control over. So I think, Craig, that's an excellent question. I think it is gonna, it is posing a challenge at that level of sovereign power over the flow of capital into and out of the region. Um, so it will have, I think, large scale uh, implications. Uh, we are in, I, I mentioned this in a talk recently, you know, Fanon wrote an essay, A Dying Colonialism. I think we're living through a dying imperialism, right? But it's not clear um, what the US, how the US will respond. I think that'll be question three, but maybe, yeah, I'll stop my comments there. Thanks, Bikram. Thank you so much for uh, for these reflections and comments. Uh, Louis, do you want to take up the second question, which I think uh, it really connects to, to what you were talking about, uh, which is, you know, basically they're asking you to, to comment and elaborate a little bit more on Assad's decision uh, to take a, a I'm stronger... Just, uh, I just read it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's a really... Yeah. Can I just ask you also to reconnect this to, to the point you were talking about Hamas before, you know, just to bring it to full circle. Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, it's one of many things which I didn't mention just because there's so much. Um, and in fact, a lot of what I spoke about can be traced actually to, to that decision. Uh, unlike so many, um, Syria did take a strong stance against the, the invasion of Iraq. Um, and the US was extremely angered by this, essentially. Uh, and US-Syria relations kind of effectively went into uh, a crisis because of that. Um, and if I recall correctly, it's around that, it is exactly around that moment that the US began to make a list of demands uh, on Syria, uh, including to expel uh, Palestinian factions, including Hamas, um, from its territory. Um, to move against Hezbollah, to withdraw from Lebanon, uh, and especially to cooperate with um, the occupation regime that the US had established in Iraq. Um, Syria was obviously never going to do those things and could not do those things. Um, but that is where it's, a, it's kind of, and actually around, around 2004, there was uh, an Israeli air raid uh, on one of the Palestinian factions in Damascus. Uh, which Bush kind of openly supported. Uh, and, you know, I think that was a clear example of Israel being used by the US as an indirect means to increase pressure. Um, and again, also in 2004, Hamas leader was, I forget, I forget the name, I apologize, but Hamas leader was assassinated in, in Damascus. Um, and in fact, and if, yeah, I mean, in hindsight, I should have mentioned this because this is also when the, the even though there has been massively more restrictive and more damaging sanctions this is when this, the sanctions first began at the end of 2003 um i think like some generic name like the syria accountability act that's when the, the sanctions really began to, to start um against syria um so thank you for yeah mentioning that because it's, it's a it's a key it's a key turning point or, you know one of and um, the extent to which um syria aided uh what does the question say yeah, the support for the Iraqi resistance. I know there was some political support. I I know that there was a lot of US pressure for them to massively increase their policing of the border, which they didn't do. So I think maybe there was like a tacit allowing of infiltration. But my understanding is they did not actively kind of arm um, the resistance, but they were politically supportive of elements of it and did not take kind of uh, border police action on its border that the US was pressuring it into. Uh, that's my understanding. Thanks, Louis. Thank you. Um, Bikram and uh, actually both of you, I think this is a question that connects to, to you know, to what you both are talking about, which is the last question, 
where are we going, you know, uh, from the audience, obviously, because me and Islam also would like to ask you some questions. Where are we going from here? You know, are we are we going to be able to stop this war drive? Are we entering after chaos so with a dying imperialism? Is this what the U.S. wants? Does the U.S. even have a strategy here? Or are we looking at, you know, the incapacity to actually have a long-term horizon? And so this is why we are into this war-driven chaos. Uh, Bikram? Yeah, so I think um, I think that's a really that's a, a really important question. I think uh, with the Biden administration saying yesterday to to Netanyahu and to to the Zionists, we won't support a counterattack uh, on Iran. Like you know, that's like the, I think we were speaking last night uh, that this is like maybe the first time we've seen some inkling of rational thinking on the part of the Americans. Whereas the axis of resistance as a whole, from the Palestinian resistance through to Hezbollah uh, to Iran. Uh, has acted rationally each step of the way, right? You can see how uh, calibrated the responses have been um, because I think there's something on the table right now. I think that here's the problem. Uh, Alexa flood, and not just Alexa flood, right? Like uh, I think in, the, in my article uh, for Ebb and, um, uh, it, you know, there, what I emphasize is that, you know, this is like a, a Palestinian, if this, if this comes to be seen as a Palestinian war of national liberation, uh, you know, we're going to see that this was in motion for 20, 25 years, right? <laughs> and even further, from the, the rise of Hezbollah, and even you can go back to the Great Revolt, right? But especially since the expulsion of Zionism from Lebanon, the problem yeah. they have encountered, and this is where I would build on some of what Louis is saying. Of course, there can be contradictions in Syria, there can be contradictions in Iran, but we can't lose sight of the fundamental question of why these states are targeted and sanctioned, right? They're targeted and sanctioned because they put to question the fundamental relations of force underpinning imperialism. Uh, that's a full stop, right? There's no other debate at all. So for the Western left, to join in on projects when Iran is clearly sanctioned in the 1990s because of the support it's giving Hezbollah. The U.S. is not even hiding that, right? Like, so that is there. And so the problem is, though, the project of the U.S. and the Zionists, especially since 2006, has been tried try to restore those conditions. It's been tried to restore those conditions of force because Western imperialism, which the U.S. is leading now, historically, over the centuries, has not been premised on coexistence. It has not been built upon that world. It's built upon a world where you establish overwhelming force through genocidal violence, and then you construct a treaty on top of that force. That is what they are in, insistent upon reestablishing. Either the economic or military are both overwhelming monopoly power over military or economic force. So this has been their whole, and this is why 2006 was such a stunning moment for them, right? And they, they then they discuss this language of a Shia crescent, and that's where they incorporate Syria and Iran and all these. We need to destroy them. And it's, it's a tragedy that the West, a uh, section of the Western left just lined up with that too much, right? But that's it. It's the fundamental relation of the force. They're trying to restore, um, but they cannot. This is the problem. They're not able to restore those relations. It is not within their hands anymore, you know? So where we are right now is, a, is, is an end to the war at this moment, right? A ceasefire will be a victory. It's not, this is, I don't, I mean, when I say victory, of course, I have said this and I'll say this before, we've already lost too many people uh, in Gaza. It's not to, it's not to, in any way, right? This, the Palestinians should not, no people should suffer, should have to suffer to this extent to gain liberation and freedom. On the question though, of the long run trajectory of imperialism and of Zionism, they are not able to restore the equation of force they need for uh, power in the region. So even a ceasefire will lead to, I think, a sharpening of contradictions and an end to Zionism and an end to US imperialism in the region. I think we can see that road. So that's the bind that they're in, right? That's the bind where they, they're trying to, that's why they want the Palestinians to accept a permanent military occupation in Gaza as part of any ceasefire. They're trying to reimpose those underlying relations of military force upon which any future treaty or peace deal is made. Um, now, absent that, the, they don't have the capacity to repress this. I don't think the U.S. wants a wider war. I think the Iranians demonstrated very clearly. I mean, let's be very clear right now what ha happened yesterday. Targets were very clearly hit with particular weapons that I think sent a particular signal to the United States that they don't have the force capacity, even if the United States wanted to attack Iran. Right? The United States doesn't have the capacity to achieve military, their military objectives. That's clear. A wider war will be destruct will, will will reign destructive across the region. I think that the implications of the wider war will still be the same. I think 
it will it will enhance and intensify destruction, but the U.S. will lose a wider war. It will accelerate, I think, the end of Zionism. Um, so I think that's the bind they're in, that they cannot restore their relations, of course. They cannot achieve military victories. Even economically, they're hamstrung in terms of what they can do because there's China standing there be behind Iran. Um, so I think what the task right now at one level is, is for Americans and people in the core states to somehow get Western chauvinists to accept a world in which they coexist rather than have to exist in relations of domination, right? There must be accountability. Like, there's a whole range of tasks uh, that are necessary there, uh, which, which have been at the table at different points in history, but have constantly been deferred uh, and denied, right? But this is the problem. These are states, capitalist imperialist states that are founded on absolute supremacism. And they're founded on supremacism. They're constitutively preclude coexistence. Now that they cannot establish the relations of force necessary for domination, then the question becomes what's gonna happen? Can they be compelled into a end of the war? Can they be compelled into leaving the region even beyond what their own uh, structural basis calls for? I think that's the that's the question. There's a, there's a quote from Marx, I think that Gassan uh, Abu Sittas uh, shared recently, that comes to be a point where the only question is defeating them. Right, and that seems to be, uh, I think, where it is with with U.S. imperialism. So, yeah, th that would be maybe how I would respond to to that final question there. We. Oui. Um, I'm not sure how much I can add to that uh, brilliant answer, which I, yeah, I largely agree with that. I mean, one thing I would say is I'm I I have always been very averse to and critical of uh, you know this kind of bumbling empire thesis that is often used to actually uh, further kind of imperialist interests or, or narratives. But I do think one thing, you know, I'm not saying that the US is bumbling, but the reaction <laughs> or the inability to deal or contain what, for, for example, Ansar Allah is doing is very striking, you know, to list them, to launch this failed military operation and then within months to then, to then offer as a carrot, oh, well, we'll remove you from the list that we just put you on and then being rejected from that, it the, it strikes me of slightly of desperation. Um, and I think, you know, in multiple ways, the the medium to long-term trajectories are against them and against, against uh, Zionism. Um, but they're in a bind, as you say, Bikram, because no they're not this not developing into a regional war is essentially a defeat for israel and they don't want that defeat but i don't think they can yet find a way to engineer something that is not and you know they're trying different things and i can, we can say none of this with any kind of finality or confidence uh you know we don't know what is going to be the response to last night but i completely concur with you bikram about the the, the long-term trajectories and and where things are headed but how 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 long it takes to get there and how bloody it is and exactly what it looks like is, is a very different question. Um, Louis Bikram, if you don't mind, I am having comrades sending me questions uh, on uh, on the chat, on the WhatsApp chat rather than on, <laughs> on Zoom. So there are, uh, there are some points being raised. Uh, one of them is being uh, uh, the importance of the ideological component. Because we talked about uh, military and economic lag, but we uh, there is the question of uh, the ideological war, which is cons you know say is this a fundamental if not a primary one here? They're they're asking me like and so the example is for example the, the Palestine solidarity people uh, or so called leftists in the West uh, or the U S based Congress representative, uh, they're asking me how much the ideological force at play in relation to Palestine and Syria has been fundamental in the battle that imperialism. Uh, uh, and uh, and Zionism wage, and on this point also a connected question is the one of the interimperialisms. How is this being used in this ideological battle? So, uh, yeah, you, Bikram, you want to go? Louis, you want to go first? I think I think this speaks. I, I'm happy yeah. to talk to Louis because Louis, this speaks to some stuff you addressed in 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 your in your part. Of yeah, the I mean, one of the uh, obviously one of the. Um the key arguments of a lot of what I was talking about and the way in which uh, the discourse and the debate was managed was by accusations of Russian and Iranian uh, imperialism in Syria. Um, 
you know, I think we probably can all uh, accept the absurdity of that. And, you know, Bikram, you spoke at the beginning about the difference between imperialism and anti-imperialism. Um, in terms of the ideological component, it's obviously key. And I think maybe this didn't come across sufficiently, but I think what I kind of is it becoming increasingly apparent to me is one of the kind of key fallouts of that propaganda campaign and everything that happened over more than a decade is large swathes of the Palestine solidarity movement in the West have been completely scrubbed of, of anti-imperialism um, and replaced, I mean, it can't be solely blamed on 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 syria and on on that decade it was obviously there was pre-existing elements um but it's very very noticeable and it's very stark uh, and obviously it isolates it has the dual effect of isolating uh syria from that broader context but then also isolating um palestine from the global uh anti-imperialist context um so i think it's yeah it's und undeniably key um uh, yeah, so I'm happy to answer too, just quickly for clarification. Mateo, are the comrades in the chat in the room with us right now? Okay, uh, you're, you're muted, you're muted. Yes, they are. They're just not able to use the, the chat because yeah, yeah. they're on the phone. So that's why. It also sounded like a very Mateo question as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like, like the ideological, the ideological leg, um, and I think the... I think that's it's it's fundamental. It's really important. I think it's still the, I mean, come on, you don't want to take. You started off. You, you guys started off with talking about historical materialism, and now you want us to say ideology is the fundamental question. You gotta you gotta decide which way we're going here. Are we? <laughs> but I think I, I'll, I'll actually okay. I have a lot to say on this question. I know I know there's another one, but um, you know, if you look at there's an interesting uh, point made by Hezbollah. I think in its 19 and maybe Louis would know this more. Uh, is it 1987 that they released like the like a, around this time? I don't know if it's a charter or a kind of a statement of principles or something, right? And, then, and, and this is always feel familiar to people anyhow, where where they make the point that there's a defeatism that has overtaken with one thing ideologically, right? Like there's a defeatism that has overtaken not just Palestinians and Lebanese, but the Arabs in general in the region. That accepts, and this is we can see with academics, what it what it accepts at some level is the eternal inevitability of Western military power, of Zionist military power, of economic power. That just the world in which it exists, we're just weaker. So what we have to do then is try to win over their public opinion. So you see, ideologically, ideology is built on a material basis, right? The ideology of defeatism is built on this basis. And so uh, what what Hezbollah announced at that time was like, a, as we develop the capacity to hit back. A part of that is also this belief that we will not be defeated, right? So they go hand in hand. And I, I know I mentioned that uh, Louis in the article that I wrote for, for you at Arab as well, is that the ideological equation of force, right? There's a material equation of force, and there's an ideological equation of force. So by the 90s, when, when Hezbollah is piercing those Merkava tanks, you're also having then the Zionist soldiers ideologically losing their belief in what they're doing. Right? And, and you see this in all of those journals that I was reading as I was researching for this article. It was comical, right? That the way the Hezbollah fighters would be like, we're ready to fight, and they ran away. Right. So there's this reversal of the ideological question that comes by challenging that fundamental relation of force of sovereignty, right? By not not, not acceding to it. Now, the problem though, with many academics and with many of the Western left, is that they took <laughs> go ahead. They took um they took um they took, I think, the end of history thesis, they absorbed it a little too much, right? They absorbed, like, you know, when you read uh, Khalidi's um, 100 Years War of Palestine, really fantastic resource in many ways, but in other ways, it keeps coming back to the futility of armed struggle because what it absorbs is the eternal invincibility, the eternal inevitability of the victory of US imperial force. So what are you left with in that then? You are left in a situation where all you can do is beg for recognition uh, from imperialists, right? And so. Then what you what do you do? What what requires you to get recognition from imperialists is to follow their language. Then, okay, please recognize Palestine. We oppose. We stand with you on Syria. We stand with you on Ukraine. We stand with you on all other questions. You, it allows for a defining of ideological terrain if you accept as permanent and inevitable those relations of military and economic force. So I think that's been um, a key problem 
is that the radical era of third worldism, it was assumed to be permanently defeated in the 1990s and the 2000s. People missed out on the significance of what uh, Hezbollah represented, right? Of what the Iranian revolution represented. And they just fell into the imperialist ideological representation of those movements and forces that were challenging imperialism. Now, again, that doesn't mean that, that anybody would say that there's no discontent or contradiction, but understand why they're being attacked. Now, look here, I'll share something that's very clarifying. The United States after the, the, the Iraq war and the global protests which emerged in the Iraq war, the United States responds with a strategy in the 2010s that is really first demonstrated in Libya, but becomes their strategy going forward, which is a strategy that they called signature reduction. So you can find this, I think there's a Newsweek article that's written about this, but signature reduction is essentially, how do we operate without being seen to be present in those regions, right? So, and Iran is a major target of the US signature reduction program. So, you know, we don't wanna be seen as we were in Iraq as an imperialist power intervening. We wanna be seen as what Obama said in Libya, leading from behind. We're simply there supporting the people. Um, and maybe we're not even there, right? So, you know, setting up NGOs and so forth, right? So I think ideologically, the way I like to think about it is if, if you don't challenge the fundamental relations of force, you can get recognition from the imperialists, right? But then you are left permanently abdicating your capacity to actually be sovereign. It's those who challenge the relations of sovereignty at a fundamental force who are ideologically represented as authoritarian, um, as Louis wrote in an earlier article of his, I think, you know, the, the leader get represented as another Hitler. Like th those are the situations where that arises fundamentally and the, where it's really become confusing for large sections, I think of the left is with this deployment of this language of inter-imperialism in our contemporary context, right? And I think this is where this also comes out of uh, the imperialists, right? You see um, uh, Hillary Clinton was the, one of the first people accusing China of imperialism uh, 10 years ago, right? Uh, which are totally, uh, I think is a totally flawed framework because you don't see those non-Western powers that are accused of being non-Western imperialisms in these trendy academic conferences now, do we see a relation in which they are uh, tied into a dialectic of development and underdevelopment with those regions that they're accused of being imperialists within? They're clearly operating as powers often informed by security imperatives uh, in response to the actions of actual imperialist powers, right? So I think, I think we can't confuse the difference between inter-imperialism uh, between great power conflict and between imperialism and anti-imperialism, right? So there's no, if you can't find that relationship of a drain of surplus value wealth, a development and underdevelopment, of a denial of development, of a de-development, uh, of that sovereign control of capital going in and out, then that's not the same thing, right? So I think that has been confusing there. Uh, but I think my final point on this will be that if you see the axis of resistance, what they have done is they do not seek recognition from the imperialists, right? They command and compel recognition. I think that's a very different uh, equation that is now being put forth that is going to lead to a lot of ideological crisis for the Western left as well. Okay, so I think Luis, uh, you are set, done, we're good. Okay. Uh, I have to go. Uh, no, thank you, I think we're, Yes, you have to go. Um, I just want to say thank you, uh, Louis and Bikram, for uh, taking all this time and actually going a little bit even ahead uh, over two hours. I just want to share one uh, last quick thing before we close is that um, this is the updated schedule. So uh, in, in roughly seven days, we're going to have uh, Wars of National Liberation, Palestine and Global South. It's going to be on the 21st, led by Justin Pudu and Alexander Avinia. And then a week after, we're going to have access to this and multipolarity. And then we're going to end with Palestine in 21st century with safe Dana. Um, I already have created the, uh, the, the way to register for an, the upcoming uh, session, which is just posted on the link in the chat. Uh, please do that. And then if you uh, missed any of the previous sessions, you can always go check uh, our lectures on uh, YouTube. Um, thank you so, so much, uh, everybody, for being here. Um, and um, and thank you again, we and Bikram for uh, all of you. Thank time. you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, guys. So. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.